Hello and welcome to the beginning of what I'm hoping is going to be a very enlightening um, series on site-to-site -site VPNs. Site-to-site uh, -site VPNs is something that inevitably you always you end up having to deal with at some point. Uh, there's lots of site-to-site -site VPNs, and of course they are um, they range in complexity and the difference between rooted uh, firewalls that have uh, root-based VPNs and policy-based VPNs. Um, a good example of which is the Palo Alto is essentially a root-based VPN uh, firewall, whereas a checkpoint or an ASA is a policy-based VPN. So just to quickly go through, so this is the the um, topology we're going to be using all the way through this. So we have our uh, Chicago firewall, we have our London firewall, and we have a desktop on either side. And um, if I just quickly flip over to the desktop, we can see that we've got this young man here. Um, this currently is an RDP session from here. So we can see we've got the 180, which is actually on the, the London side. Um, that's, there's a NAT rule, so I'm getting to it from my network. So we've got 180. And then we are watching, uh, or listening to rather, this um, this music stream, which I've muted because I can't handle it, um, this music stream from the other side, from the 101002, that's an RDP session that's running across our VPN. Okay, so if you just give, bin that and come back to here. And if we now look at um, our VPN, the VPN in question is going to be VM London to VM Chicago, and it's represented by these uh, these tunnels here. We've got two tunnels um, and we can see that we've got the reason for the stream is we can see that if we look in our tunnel info let me just increase that so we look in our tunnel info we can see that if we refresh this that we've got the uh, end caps and d caps are incrementing uh, and the bytes are incrementing and going up and down and the reason for that is just so that we've got a constant flow of data across our across our vpn I'm just going to increase the size of that because I keep forgetting to do that. Okay, so VPNs are, I mean, they say they're, they're very old. They've been around since the dawn time. I remember doing them when I first started. In fact, one of my first first roles was actually doing VPNs. Was just I was kind of a VPN guy when VPN tickets came through. That was that was kind of what I did. Um, but they're just as relevant today. And in fact, actually, they're just about to undergo a major change as well as far as the encryption and and the um, the ICE and everything is concerned with the advent of um, PQC which is post quantum computing so specifically um, the Chicago firewall that we've got which is 11.1 .1, that supports the um, post quantum computing VPN configuration and we'll just see what that looks like okay I'm gonna do that we're gonna go to the uh, our ICE gateway for the Chicago side, I'm just going to click into our gateway, and then we have our advanced options there. And then we can see that under Ike V2, we've got general and we've got post quantum PPK. Now we're going to get into this a lot further down, a lot further down the line. We're going to get into what this means and the reason why we, we do it. I mean, the reason is basically harvest now, uh, crack later um, attacks where uh, the Ike, uh, the Ike exchange is captured. And then people work on cracking that in order to get the keys, the IP set keys, and decrypt your traffic. There's multiple um, multiple reasons why you'd want, obviously, not want this to happen. But there's also multiple risk levels associated with this. It's how long you keep the same keys, how long you keep doing, you know, sort of the, the same things. Um, but we're going to look into that. Okay. So this first video is going to be about the components of the uh, IPsec VPNs on. Um, on Palo Alto firewalls, just as a refresher for some, and if you're absolutely new to, to configuring the VPN, then um, hopefully this will this will help. So, effectively, we're made up of two components. We have our Ike gateway, and we have our IPsec tunnel, and we put them together. Simply, we create our Ike gateway, which is here. So we'll go back into this again to have a look. So in here, we've got the name of our our VPN, so that's any sort of, um, you can give that any intuitive name, anything that identifies it. We have the versions, we have Ike V1 only mode, um, which is Ike V1, I mean, is, is deprecated by <laughs> for quite some time now. However, 
it is something that is, is still very much alive and well in enterprise and you will come across it um, on a relatively regular basis. We have Ike V2 only mode, so it'll only negotiate Ike V2. And then of course we've got Ike V2 preferred, which is it will prefer Ike V2, but if the other side doesn't support it, it will drop down to Ike V1. You'll find yourself adjusting these more and more, I would have thought, as you migrate from um, your current IPsec VPNs to more secure VPNs, um, where the other side might need a bit of time to catch up. Um, because as a general rule, you will find that when you're creating a VPN with the other side, if you don't have the other side's uh, attention and their details, th things aren't going to work too well. Okay, so then we've got address type IPv4 and IPv6. Speaks for itself. What type of address are you going to use for this tunnel, for this uh, for this IAC gateway? And then the interface that we're going to use and the local IP address of that interface. Next, we can select our peer IP address type. So what's our peer going to... Uh, IP address type going to be, is it going to be an IP, is it going to be an FQDN, or is it going to be dynamic? So with IP, obviously we get the IP, with FQDN we're going to use an FQDN where you'd use that, um, say if the other side is behind DHCP or something like this, or it's, you know, there's reasons for uh, its address going to be changing, you use an FQDN, um, or dynamic, uh, where you'd use dynamic where the uh, the peer isn't known, so you don't know the the address of the peer. Um, but in this particular um, in this particular scenario, you'd use you'd be a responder only, as we'll see later. So we're going to stick with IP. So I don't want to break my VPN. Then we come to authentication. So we've got pre-shared key or certificate. Uh, we can use a certificate. We can generate a certificate and um, put that on the other firewall, and that will be used uh, to to authenticate mutually as opposed to a pre-share key. And um, one of the videos will migrate this from a pre-share key to a certificate, see how that's done. And then as we've got pre-shared key selected, we're gonna use pre-share key and then confirm it as you always do. So local identification, which is just popped off the screen. So local, local identification is the IP address of this firewall. Okay, which in our case is going to be and then our peer identification, which is going to be IP address as well. Okay, I'm not going to OK that because I don't need to necessarily because it's already there. It's just because I changed that uh, configuration above that it's, it's blanked it out. Okay, so if we go to our advanced options, we've got uh, enable passive mode. So in passive mode, you are you're only going to be um, able to respond. You will not be able to initiate um, the connection, which we'll see in a minute. And then um, enable NAT traversal. So NAT traversal is something else we'll talk about, and that is uh, where you encapsulate the whole thing in another in another header um, to allow for NAT traversal. So then Ike V2, uh, under, under VM Chicago, because it's different, you can see we've got two options here. So our Ike V2, we're going to select our crypto profile and... That's when we configure uh, somewhere else. You'll see them at the bottom. All right, crypto's there. And then the liveness check. So we're going to check for the liveness of the of the tunnel. If we go to uh, the post-quantum PPK, so enable post-quantum pre-shared key. We can have up to 10 keys in here. Um, and this is, so negotiation mode is preferred. So if the other side supports it, then yes, we'll definitely do it. Uh, but if not, then fine. And then mandatory is absolutely the other side has to have these as well. And these post quantum pre shared keys are sent uh, out of band. So you by out of band, I mean not during this negotiation. Some other medium will be used to send this to the other side, and then they must match both sides. Symmetric so keys. Okay, so I'm going to cancel out of that. Uh, as we said, so if we're looking at Ike Crypto, so the one that we was using was Secure Crypto. Um, and then this is where we can create our crypto profile. So this is what our, our uh, Ike gateway is going to use. So we've got a Diffie-Hellman group. We can add it there. We can also add them in order of preference. So we can add multiple. We can put 14 under there. And then it would use 20. And if it couldn't, it would drop back to 14. The, the greater amount you have, the, um, the more flexible you can be with the other side. Although, I mean, if it's negotiated, you know, if you've agreed parameters either side, then um, then you should be okay. Uh, the encryption, so AES-256-GCM um, or CBC. 
where there's CBC, you'll need um, an authentication, which will be SHA-256, SHA-38, or SHA-512. Um, when uh, GCM, because GCM has its own authentication, it has its own authentication mechanism, you select non-auth. And then we have the timers for the, the lifetime, the key lifetime. Uh, so you've got hours and you can take that down to minutes um, and seconds. Uh, so eight hours, I would suggest is probably about right. So it'll renew the keys after eight hours. And then Ike V2 authentication. Okay, and this controls uh, the amount of times that the, the gateway can renegotiate the keys. So it's a multiple of this figure here. Um, so for re just renegotiating the keys in band uh, before it has to then um, complete a, a full Ike V2 um, re-authentication. Re so it starts again completely. Um, zero simply means it's, um, it's disabled. Okay, so moving on into IPsec crypto. IPsec crypto is essentially the same. So this is where we create our profiles, our crypto profiles for our VPNs. But this now is for IPsec as opposed to Ikes. This is for our IPsec tunnels. And it's slightly different. We have IPsec protocol, ESP, um, or authenticating header. Uh, we have GCM, again, for our encryption uh, and authentication num because we have GCM. Uh, we can have CBC and, and so on. Uh, three days I'd, I'd stay away from like the plague. And again, if we move it up and down, then that's the order of preference. We have the Diffie-Hellman group. Um, I believe, don't quote me, but I believe that versions under 10.1 don't support group 21, although it does appear in the, in the GUI. Uh, the lifetime of that obviously is, again, the lifetime of the IPsec association. And then we have the minimum, it says our minimum is, is three. Um, and then we have a life size, so we can enable a life size of the, the, the transfer. That is wrapped up. So if we go into our gateways again, let's say we can see that when we go in and select here, we've got our IIC crypto profile. And if we look in our tunnels, we can see in our tunnels that uh, that's also selected here. So we have the IIC gateway. So this this tunnel is being initiated by the IIC gateways. We know this is, this is the gateway it's going to use. And then we have our IPsec crypto profile here, which is default at the minute. We can use suite B, GCM 256 or suite, uh, suite B, GCM 128. Those are built in. We have advanced options. So uh, enabling the replay. Okay, so effectively the replay protection is a mechanism that's put into IPsec and basically means that the the, during the, the, the course of the IPsec packets and everything like that, there is a sequence number attached to, to that packet. And the other side keeps a reference, starts at zero and works its way up. And the other side will keep a what's called a sliding window of a certain size. And that is this anti-replay window. And it maintains that as it goes along. So what you'll end up with is you'll end up with a certain sequence of to allow the, the, the mechanism for retransmit if needed. You have a certain sequence of um, numbers that are then considered valid by the other side. And that's a sliding window. It goes along at this side. So along during the conversation, you'll have this. And it's, the idea is to stop attackers from capturing packets and then replaying the packets, injecting something into and replaying the packets because... By the time they've done that, by the time they've started to do it, the chances are that that window will have passed and then everything underneath that window will, uh, sorry, outside of that window will be um, will be rejected. Okay, we've got the uh, copy type of service header, so we can copy the type of service for QoS purposes and so on. The IPsec mode, which is tunnel and transport mode. We'll go into those a little bit later as well. We can add GRE encapsulation if we want to, and then we can have a tunnel monitor so we can monitor uh, we can monitor the tunnels and that uh, that controls the failover to another tunnel or a fail or um, whether how quickly the tunnel's restarted and so on. And we've also got a comment. So proxy IDs. Proxy IDs not strictly necessary for Palo Alto firewalls based on the fact they're a root-based uh, VPN. Um, so you can use them, or you need to use them with things like Checkpoint and, and so on because uh, they, they're they policy-based uh, VPNs. So they have what they call interesting traffic, if anybody remembers from the old ASA days. 
Um, although it can help, it can help as a reference, and it's I am unsure because the documentation is unclear um, as to whether it uh, it assists with the setup of the tunnels in, in Palo Alto. But either way, they're there, they're done, and even if it's only a reference for you, then you know. So you've got the local side, so this is what I've got on my side, and then the remote side, and that would be that generates, remember, the old tunnel configuration from uh, from ASA days. Uh, IPv6 is simply the same thing, but in IPv6. Okay, so then if you look at the, the readout from the tunnels, we have the IAC info here, so I'll just increase this. So we can see that the IAC info is London, that's our, our IAC uh, connectivity that we've got, that's our gateway. Um, the gateway is one, the role was uh, in, it, in it or initiator, so in this particular instance, we initiated the packet from the Chicago side. I did that by creating the, the connectivity across from the, um, the remote desktops. We've got the mode, got the algorithm, the uh, pre-shared key, Diffie Hellman Group 20, AES 256, GCM 16 combined, uh, when it was created, and we also have when it expires, and we can refresh that information as well if we needed to, but there's very little reason to do that. Um, we have the security zone that the tunnel interface is sat in, security zones again play a part, uh, when we're creating the policies for these and we have the status of the tunnel and it's currently up and any comments if we wanted to. We can see the routes, so we can show the routes there and we can see that we have a route across to 10100 25 and that is, uh, that's going across that, uh, that, that tunnel. Uh, sorry, I'm completely insane. That's our side. Obviously, the opposite side is the 172.16, sorry, yes, and we can see that there's tunnel interface there, tunnel 20, so we know it's going up tunnel 20 to get there. If we look at our uh, IPsec, so this is our tunnel info. So we've got London to uh, London, London, it's named that way, I, I don't know, it's, but it, this is our tunnel to London, our local IP is 182, uh, peer IP is 180, the remote IP is that. A monitor IP, so if we have a tunnel monitor, that would be what we was monitoring on the other side. It's basically a ping test to the other side to make sure the tunnel stays up. We have the packets encapsulated, so how many packets have we encapsulated and sent to them? Uh, packets decapsulated, how many packets have they sent to us uh, encapsulated or, or encrypted and we've, we've decrypted them? And then we have bytes and then uh, and that's it. And as we can see, if we refresh this, we can see that um, increments as we saw before for the um, for the traffic that's flowing across it okay the only other thing we need then is we need a route so once we've got a route well, that's not that's, that's a lie we don't just need another route we need a policy as well um, but we'll see about that in a second so uh, so we've got a route here as well so we have a static route you can use um, you can use dynamic routing and that's probably something else we should look at at some point uh, within this this video series and that's simply I've got a route to so the 172.16 slash 25 um, subnet and it's going up tunnel 20 and the next hop is the other side of the tunnel um, although you wouldn't necessarily need the next hop I don't believe although I always put it in um, just as a contrast if we come over to the VM London side it's quite annoying uh, if we come to the VM London side just to show the difference between the two so if we go to our we go to our Ike configuration and we come to our advanced options. So at Ike V2, you can see that, so this doesn't support the PPK because this is 10.2 or 10.1, I believe. So this doesn't support the PPK, so that's where the difference is there. But again, we can see exactly the same thing on this side. We can see that our tunnels are up and we can see our routes. And this time, the 10100102.25 is on tunnel 20, which is going back the other way. Those numbers don't have to match, by the way. They can be different on either side. Um, it's just it's locally referenced. And if we come back here and we have a look at our policies. So we don't currently have any any policies for this traffic. And the reason I don't currently have any policies for this traffic is because our tunnel interface which we'll have here. Our tunnel interface lives on the Chicago LAN. Now, if that came into, say, London VPN security zone, if we created a security zone made at London VPN, we would then need rules for it to be able to get to the Chicago LAN. But currently, if you think about it this way, currently that lands in 
um, that lands in the Chicago land, thus it's then regarded as intrazone traffic. Okay, so that's that's a quick run through of of the VPNs or the VPN configuration. Uh, so it's only part one. We are going to go really in depth, and we're going to make our VPNs as secure as we can possibly get them. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the, the post quantum um, computing uh, thing as well, because I mean that's that's something that is very um, it's very open at the minute. There are multiple and has been multiple um, requests by NIST for people to come up with cryptographic profiles and so on in order to, to, to stop this. And basically the idea being that it would take many, many hundreds of thousands of years uh, to crack the encryption we have today, um, but a quantum computer built specifically for that purpose will be able to uh, to crack it in a matter of hours, possibly even minutes, depending on how strong they get. Um, there has been some stuff in the news about uh, China have already created it and so on. I don't know whether that's true. I don't know whether we'd ever find out if anybody did. Um, it's just one of those things I don't think any anybody would would own up to to doing necessarily. Um, so you never know, and of course it's better to be safe than sorry. So this whole series um, hopefully is going to be securing everything as much as we possibly can with our site-to-site -site VPNs, our IPsec configurations um, with Palo Alto. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.